We are delighted to have Olu Brown and Joshua Swanson with us today to lead us this morning in this time of conversation. Olu, welcome back to Holston Conference. You've been a part of Resurrection and been a part of uh, Minister's Convocation. So we are delighted to have you back and to listen and learn from you and as we think about missional hubs. He's the founding pastor of Impact Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He's the author of Leadership Directions for Moses and 4D Impact, Smash Barriers Like a Smart Church, and both of his books are available back uh, in the back corner there. We, as missional hub leaders, can learn lessons from Moses in this time of dramatic shift in our denomination. As we shift to working together, so that we are missional and that we continue to build relationships within our communities. Joshua Swanson will be giving the Holston response. He is the son of Bishop James Swanson, and he serves at Ketron Memorial United Methodist Church here in Kingsport. He has been highly recommended by leaders of our conference. As one person said, he is one of our up-and-coming young pastors. So we are delighted to learn and hear from Olu and Joshua today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today, to be here in the Holson Annual Conference. Let's give your Bishop, Bishop Taylor, a hand clap of praise. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you. And to Rusty, always a blessing to see you and to be here with you. And to Lori and to Susan, thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. And thank you for the music and the time of worship and centering. I look forward to Joshua uh, sharing after uh, we talk about leadership directions from Moses and all that is happening here with the Missional Hubs training. And it's a blessing also to be joined by Phil. We're a part of the North Georgia Annual Conference, and he is going to knock it out of the park. I'm just setting it up, and Phil is going to hit a home run. And uh, for Ann for uh, switching with us last night, thank you so much. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. As we are guided and led in this conversation, we know that you are with us and you are leading us every step of the way. It's in Christ's name that we pray and ask it all. Amen. Well, there are a couple of resources we'll be referring to in your packets. You have this handout. If you'll pull this out, <clears throat> after we have uh, each point section covered, we will take about five minutes around our tables to discuss one of the quadrants that you see here, and we'll walk through that. But if you'll have it handy, there's a book that I'll be referencing, uh, Think Outside of the Building. You'll have an opportunity to see that on the screen, but this comes from the corporate world, but I think it is a great example for us in the religious community. And then I'll also be referencing these two book uh, resources that I brought from Atlanta uh, that are a part of our church, uh, Impact Church. We turned uh, 13 years old in January, and as a new start church, and people ask, Olu, how long are you going to say that the church is a new church? church plant. Well, I get a chance to visit churches across the country that are close to 200 years old. And so we don't even exist yet as a 13-year-old church. So I figure we'll continue to say uh, we're a new church and a new start for a little while longer. Uh, the book that I won't be teaching directly from is the latest book that came out by Cokesbury uh, this last year, and it's called 4D Impact. One of the things that I've found when I get a chance to travel the country is to hear real life stories from leaders just like you, whether it's clergy or lay or denominational leaders who are passionate about their community, they're passionate about their local church, and they wanna see a difference and a change, but need some real time tools. And as much as we love seminaries and all of the wonderful Bible colleges, I'm discovering that even a lot of our seminaries and Bible colleges aren't teaching some of the real time tools to help leaders in the ministry of the local church. And so this book really is about four key principles to have a healthier, more dynamic local church. Not bigger, because bigger isn't always the healthiest, but rather healthy and vital. And so I believe if you can lock in on these four key principles, one being hospitality, which is huge, and that's the biggest part of the book. The second, systems, and systems can range from people to a volunteer system. 
A third is technology and how do we lean deeply into technology? And then the fourth being design of worship. How do we design worship? Because if we think about it, Sunday morning is the day when we see the most number of people in all of our local churches. But sadly, that's the day that we prepare the least for. And so 4D Impact is all about that journey. Now, we're going to be teaching from the book Leadership Directions from Moses. And it's a scripture, we'll see it in just a minute or two, from Numbers chapter 32, where Moses has this wonderful leadership opportunity, and it could have changed the trajectory of what we read in the New Testament, or rather the Old Testament, and of course could have changed the trajectory of what we read in the New Testament. So that's what we'll be teaching from, and I hope that it's a blessing as you lean into your missional hubs and got a great chance to hear last night some of the things that are working well, some of the things that might not be working well, but I hope you are encouraged by this weekend to know that evolution, journey, adjustment, all of those things are okay. Because on this creative journey of reaching people for Jesus Christ, we're not always gonna get it right. But we have to continue to adjust and we have to continue to make room for new ideas and new opportunities to reach people for Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. All right, well, let's lean into it. There is this wonderful scripture that I just referenced, Numbers chapter 32, verse number five, and It's also in your packet, my handout, but if you can see that on the count of three, let's read that out loud together. One, two, three. If you... Have you ever heard people say that in the local church? Don't make us do vacation Bible school again. Don't make us reach these kids down the street because they don't look like our kids. And so this is a pivotal moment in Moses' leadership journey. Okay, it's early in the morning. We've had our coffee. We've had some good breakfast. I need 12 volunteers to help me out very quickly. 12 volunteers. 12, if you'll come join me here. And as they come up, let's give them a hand clap of praise. (laughs) Wonderful. I'm going to use the two of you to be the Reubenites and the Gadites. Is that all right? Okay. So when we read the biblical text in Joshua and he's dividing the land, we always assume that all 12 tribes go in. Is that right? But for all of you biblical scholars, did all 12 tribes go in? Really, two and a half tribes did not go in. I didn't fool with the half tribe in this text. I just messed around with two of the tribes, the Reubenites and the Gadites. All right, you too will be the Reubenites and the Gadites. Is it all right? So here is Moses, and you always get bad news on your off day. Susan, bad news never comes on the day that you're doing work and you've got full capacity. It always comes on the day when you decide to go golfing or you decide to go fishing or you decide to go to the movie. So Moses is on his off day. They have been traveling together for some time. Everybody has been clear on the vision. They sent an Instagram post. They sent a text message. They even bought an airplane to fly in the scry to say we are headed where? To the promised land. But suddenly on Moses' off day, two of the tribal leaders come and they basically say, Moses, we want to stay where we are. Now, that area is called the Transjordan. Can we do a little role play? Mm -hmm. All right. So Moses is in his tent. And even then, they had ring doorbells. So you'll come ring my ring doorbell, and then we'll have a conversation. So I'm getting ready to golf, and you ring my ring doorbell. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Rubenites, Gadites, how are you doing? We're great. Hold on one second. I'm getting ready for my golf game. Hold. Hey, how are y'all doing? We're doing great. Yeah, we're happy right where we are. Wait, hold on. We're not here. We like it here. Now wait. We just had dinner two weeks ago at your house, and you didn't say anything that about it. We, we have just a, talked about yeah, it. We, just talked about, we don't want to change. And we just decided we, we want to stay nice here. Well, yeah. I, 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 I like the well, way you decorated yeah, your tent. Yeah, we yeah, just had right. admin board a month ago, and we had this on the agenda, and the two of you said that you really wanted to go to the promised land. Yeah, yeah. but we talked later, yeah. and, and I, I put up new lot. curtains in the tent, and I wanted to watch In the them. parking yeah. lot, we but, decided. But God has a land of milk and honey. Well, oh, we, we got plenty to eat here. Plenty. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, those United Methods uh-huh. women will cook. Yeah. The United Methods? <laughs> <laughs> and the men are going to do the barbecue, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah, great. Yeah, All right, yeah, Paul, right. let's you give them a hand, 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 hand clap. Don't move, don't move. 
Now, here is the pivotal moment of leadership for Moses. And it is the same that we face as lay and clergy. This could have derailed the whole plan. What happens sometimes as leaders, and it happens to me, is I can super focus and emphasize on the minority group that doesn't want the big picture anymore. And what happens as leaders, let's come over here a little bit, if we're not careful, we'll give this minority group all of our attention and all of our energy. We want it. But yeah. there are 10 other people, wave your hands, yeah. who still want to go to the promised land. They still want to do vacation Bible school. They still want to reach kids in the community. They still want to remodel the fellowship hall. It's just these two mm -hmm. who have a different plan. Mm -hmm. So the first mistake we can make as leaders is to focus too much on the minority group that no longer wants to go, and we can forget the majority of people who are still super excited. You want to go? Y'all are still super excited? Oh, you said you didn't like them anyway. <laughs> here's, the, here's the second thing that we do as leaders, and I do this too all the time. We can demonize other people for having a different vision. Yeah. Because sometimes we think, because for those of you who are clergy, we're the pastor, the vision has to come through us. Or as lay people, because we're the admin board leader, the vision has to come through us. But sometimes what happens is we have to give other people permission to live into what God is showing and telling them. Is that right? So as you think about kids, and many of you have children, many of you have children who are grown, many of you have grandchildren, but did you ever raise this kid and you had this path for them for a particular <laughs> degree in college? And I mean, you had been saving their whole life, and after their first semester of college, they not only tell you they're not in that degree anymore, but they also tell you they're not in college anymore. How does that work out? And they say, well, mom, I still got a vision. But no, that was not the vision we saved 18 years for. And so what happens to leaders is we can demonize other people for hearing from God the same way we heard from God. But here's what we have to learn to be able to do. It's to say, it has been a wonderful journey. And I have enjoyed yeah, walking enjoyed. with you and your families. You. And we are going to miss you. I mean, when we have our barbecue, we're going to think about you all, and we're going to lift you up in prayer. But here's what we've got to be able to say. Thank you and what? Goodbye. And we grab these 10, and we keep moving. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Y'all can grab your seats. You can grab your seats. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. So here's what happens in this very moment is that Moses and the Israelites could have gotten stuck where they were. But yet they saw that God still had a chance and an opportunity for them to reach the future. And so what we notice in this text, and so often when we read the biblical stories, we think it was a perfect journey. It wasn't perfect, but it was an opportunity to make an adjustment and a shift. And that's what I heard last night about your missional hubs. Some of you have to make some adjustments. Some of you have to make some shifts. It's okay. It's biblical leadership. Every once in a while, there's a pothole. Every once in a while, there's a detour. Every once in a while, there's a blizzard like we drove through coming over the mountain to Asheville. Every once in a while, there's a snowstorm. Every once in a while, there's a hurricane or whatever the disaster is. And so that is an opportunity to make a shift. It was a new opportunity to reach an original goal and vision, which was what? The promised land. Notice, the goal and the vision did not change. The strategy and the adjustment to get there had to shift. The mission and vision hasn't changed, but the strategy sometimes changes. And that's the encouragement for you and your missional hubs. Here's what changes, and here's what can shift from time to time. Your resources will shift. Your opportunities will shift. Your apportionments will shift, your demographics will shift, your culture will shift, your appointments will shift, and even sometimes the denomination will shift. But the mission and the vision never shifts. It always what? Stays the same. And so even though these things may shift, we must still stay steady on the vision. So I know a lot of you here in the Holston Conference, like North Georgia, may be concerned about what's happening in the denomination, what's going to happen in May. But has the mission of Jesus Christ changed? 
And if the mission of Jesus Christ hasn't changed, guess what? You have to be steadfast and movable, always going forward in the word of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 And so when we think about Moses' journey in the book, here is a comment that I wrote. Although Moses was a gifted leader, I suspect he always struggled with difficult conversations. And that struggle continued into his years as the Israelites' leader. Back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, when Moses confessed to God that he had a stuttering problem, maybe this confession was a cover for the part of him that was afraid to speak to Pharaoh and to what? God's people. So whether you're doing a missional hub or whether you're a layperson working in the marketplace, you will always have difficult conversations. And what are those conversations? It's a conversation with self that raises the question, who am I? It's a conversation with others that raises the question, what are we called to? And it's a conversation with God. What are you blessing? Now, here's what's hard to believe. As a clergy person, one of the hardest things for me is to have difficult conversations. If you were to do a personality study of my life, guess what it would come up? I am an extreme extrovert. On Sunday morning, I can function as, or rather, I'm an extreme introvert. On Sunday morning, I can function as a what? Extrovert. But after Sunday is over with, I am alone by myself with just a couple of people, and that is more than enough for me. And so it is very hard for me to have these difficult conversations. And so I get what Moses was going through, and I get what each of you go through. But to lean into the mission that God has given us in the 21st century, we have to be willing to have these three difficult conversations. So we're going to be walking along with our handout and we're going to get into each of these. And I believe with what Anne has shared, with what I'm sharing and what Phil is sharing, you'll be pumped up and ready to go back into the mission field to continue to do the work of Jesus Christ. So. Let's take a quick five minute circle up and I want you to talk in your circles about this top left quadrant and it says act, dream and think differently. What are some difficult conversations that you're having right now in your local church? If you're a lay person in your church or beyond the local church, but what are some of these conversations that are causing you to act, dream and think differently? They're not easy, but you're having to have them. We're going to do this, and we'll be right back. Talk amongst your table. Uh, Lloyd-Jones, clergy, Jefferson City, Tennessee. You can hold it. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. So uh, very briefly, a couple of the difficult conversations are for those who serve rural, um, older congregations. The conversation is often, listen, we've been doing this so long, we're tired. We need somebody else to do it. Yeah, people know that. Um, one of the other difficult conversations is 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 how what's going to happen in May and following is is sucking some of the energy and wind out of our our ministries. That it's taking too much energy and too much time away from from the focus mm -hmm. on, the, on the vision and mission. Another one is is this idea of we do collective ministry. This kind of um, dialogue about um, where our priorities should lie with, with who is actually more worthy to receive that collective ministry than others who may not be. Thank you. Thank you. One more comment. Hi, Melissa Malcolm, clergy. And we were discussing the fact that it's hard to get people to talk within the walls of the church about the things that are scaring them or are new to them. They tend to have parking lot meetings or on the phone meetings and to get them into the walls of the church to talk about and hear new perspectives on the things they're scared of. And as a result, that kind of, they put the brakes on and they're not hearing all the options. So I think that's a challenge to get them to come in and talk about the new things. Thank you. In the name of your church? Uh, I'm at Cedar Grove and Ebenezer in the Three Rivers District. Awesome. Thank you. And I appreciate each of you for sharing your difficult conversations. We'll have an opportunity to hear from more people, but this is vital and very important. So let's look at that first difficult conversation, and this is the self-difficult conversation. And it raises the question, 
who am I? Like Moses, as we embark on this journey of developing and continuing our missional hubs, we have to consistently ask these three difficult questions, self, others, and God. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper with this self question, who am I? Now, this is an opportunity for what the therapy community calls self-differentiation. Now, what is self-differentiation? Self-differentiation involves being able to possess and identify your own thoughts and feelings and distinguish them from others. It's a process of not losing connection to self while holding a deep connection to others, including those you love whose views may differ from your views. Now, the Reubenites and the Gadites may have developed some dislikes from the broader community, but they were self-differentiating from the rest of the Israelite community. To self-differentiate takes courage. It can be an anxious and a tension-filled moment, but at the end of the day, to self-differentiate means that you ask the question, who am I in Jesus Christ? Who is our church in Jesus Christ, our district, our annual conference in Jesus Christ? And that is the power of self-differentiation. We also have to do that with the missional hubs. Your missional hub, what is the difference about your missional hub that is contextual for the community or the change that God has called you to do? So this self-question is broad, it is deep, and it is vital. How do we get to this self-question? Here's what we gotta do. You have to remember your burning bush moment. Now, this is really more of a burning tree, but you get it, it's a burning bush. That's how you self-differentiate. You have to remember and recall your burning bush moment. Now, in Exodus chapter three, verse two, it says these words. The Lord's messenger appeared to him, meaning Moses, in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it did not burn up. That was Moses' moment to say, I am different from everyone else. I know what happened with my mother putting me in the Nile River. I know being raised in Pharaoh's. I know what I did to harm somebody. I know all of that. But this was the moment where God said, look, Moses, I am setting you apart. And this is what makes you different from everyone else. One of the blessings of the United Methodist Church is that we are a connectional community. But one of the challenges of it is that we don't always do the difficult soul work to determine as United Methodists, what is God calling us to do in this community? What works in North Georgia might not work in Holston, but it doesn't make the ministries any less, but rather it makes them different. And it's hard work to determine who we are individually and collectively in Jesus Christ. See, this was the moment when Moses' destiny connected with his entire life journey and he was deployed to deliver his people from bondage. That's when Moses says, I got it. This is what I'm called to do, and this is what I'm called to be. People might not like it. As a matter of fact, Pharaoh's gonna try to kill me, but I am different, and this is why I'm different, and I'm willing to give the rest of my life to it. Do you know how specifically God has called you as a pastor, as a layperson, as a church, as a leader to be able to stand up and say for this season of this missional hub, this is who we are, these are the sacrifices we're willing to make, and this is where we're going. Now, so often when we say this word self, we think individual, but it can also take on a collective meaning. There is this company in Atlanta, Georgia, where their corporate office isn't too far from our church. And there are some folks who are part of our church who work for this corporate office. And it is a wonderful company called Chick-fil-A. Can I get an amen for Chick-fil-A? Can I get another amen for sweet tea? All right. <laughs> now, let me give you an example of individual and also corporate different differentiation. I have been a charter member of Chick-fil-A for some time. Uh, there are seats and benches and stained glass windows that my family helped purchase. 
I'm telling you, we have been a charter member for quite a while. So you can imagine when I came to worship one day, not on a Sunday, because we don't worship on Sundays at Chick-fil-A of church. But when I came to worship on Monday and I walked in and they gave me the order of worship, somebody had changed the order of worship. Can you believe that they changed it and did not even consult me? I mean, the owner operator, the pastor had my number, had my email, and he knew that my family had been members of this church for 50 years and they had the nerve to change the order of worship. What did they do? They changed a menu item. Do you know the menu item they changed? The number nine. I almost lost my mind. I said, who do you think you are? And so I'm a good church Methodist. And the first thing I did was pull out my book of discipline. And so I said, OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write my district superintendent. So I wrote the district superintendent of the church at Chick-fil-A. And the district superintendent responded and said, thank you, Brother Olu, for being a charter member of the church of Chick-fil-A. We understand your concern. But as the district superintendent, the pastor of that church has right and authority to work with the other members of that church to change the menu. So I pull out my discipline again. I said, well, who's higher than the district superintendent? I said, I'm going to write the bishop. And so I wrote a note to the bishop and I said, Bishop of the Church of Chick-fil-A, I want you to understand that I went through the hierarchy of the church and I have not gotten my issue addressed. And so the bishop writes back to me and says, OK, we hear your concern, but we want to let you know why we changed the menu item. And here is why Chick-fil-A changed the menu item. Number one, the sales were declining. Number two, it was more trouble than it was worth from an operational perspective. Number three, clear out the old and make way for the new. They're calling me old. <laughs> and number four, millennial dollars rule, and it definitely appeals to a what audience? An older audience. You're telling me you took away something I loved because it wasn't making money, because to put all of the menu items together was more trouble than it was worth. You mean you were dreaming of doing something new as a company and you weren't willing to let me hold you hostage to where you've been because I like the number nine, but yet you're dreaming about a number 20. And because I'm so passionate about a number nine and my family's connected to a number nine, you're telling me you don't love me enough to let me hold your vision hostage. And then after all is said and done, you're calling me old. And so the bishop says, oh, Lou, I want you to know this is why we changed your worship order. And here's what we want you to know. If you like the number nine so much and if you want to keep us in the number nine era as a company, here's the menu. You can make it yourself. They said, if you love it that much and you want to hold us hostage to where we used to be, and to keep us from where God is taking us to, here are the ingredients to the number nine. Now here's what's crazy. I am still a member of the Church of Chick-fil-A. And I still go about three or four times a week. I still pay my tithes and I still pay my offerings. And guess what? I have not made the number nine a single time. Now I wanna say this for all of you pastors, most of the people who are complaining, just give them the menu and let them make it themselves and, and they'll stop complaining. But here is the note, and it's a funny note. It's a corporate example, but it's also a self-example. And I appreciate Chick-fil-A because they weren't willing to hold me hostage to my image of what they should be as a company. And so often in our churches and in our leadership roles, we are acting out of images, not of who God has called us to be, but about what people need us to be and about what people want us to be. You know, some of you have worship the way you have worship because one of your biggest givers and your strongest leaders feel that worship should be the way it was when they were 12 years old growing up in their small church. And now they're 65 years old and they're helping to lead your church and you have no idea that your worship is no longer being orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, but it's being orchestrated by the 12 year old image of worship that this person had years ago. But we're afraid to step out and say, God, who do you want us to be in 2020? Who do you want us to be in 2021? Who do you want us to be for?
for the people who need us not to be what we've been, but to be what you've called us to be. And that's why I support Chick-fil-A. And like every company, they have their issues. Part of the reason why I support them is because they were willing to upset me to be focused on the vision of what they had as a company. At the end of the day, they make chicken biscuits. If they went out of business, the world would go on. Friends, if we, out of, if we go out of business, the whole world would be much different. We connect people to eternity through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's even more important for us to self-differentiate than a company that makes some wonderful chicken biscuits. All right, so I want you to look at your handout, the top left quadrant, it's self, who am I? Remember your burning bush. Now, we're gonna take another five minutes here. I want you to begin listing, and you can do it from yourself individually. You can do it from your leadership role in the church. For those of you who lay, it can be church, it can be the marketplace. If you're with your missional hub leadership team, you can do it for that. But I want you to take some time in this quadrant to self-differentiate. What is that burning bush moment when God gave you that vision? What was that vision? What was the purpose of that vision? And what do you see as the future? Once again, you're not doing carbon copy. It's self-differentiation or collective differentiation. It is the unique call that God has on your specific life or the ministry. My friend Sarah, she has a testimony. Uh, she's going to be one of our two comments uh, that we'll have about this self-conversation. But she had an interesting interaction with the church that we're both members of. And then if we got one more person who wants to give a commentary about this self. I Go ahead. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. My name is Sarah Varnell. I'm clergy. I'm about to turn 37 years old. I have three small kids. I worked at Chick-fil-A when I was in high school, starting at age 14, and I learned that my favorite meal was the number five eight pack, okay? And a few years back, I went to Chick-fil-A with my kids swirling around me, and I ordered their food, and then I said, I'd like to have the number five eight pack, and that sweet little girl behind the counter said, you mean the number three eight pack? And I said, um, no, I mean the number five. And she said, oh no, it's a number three now, and I said, Hold up. It has been a five for 17 years. I worked at Chick-fil-A, and it was a number five. And it's been a number five through my 20s, and it's been a number five when I've had kids. Like, y'all, literally, this is the meltdown I'm having in the Chick-fil-A at Fountain City with all the people behind me. And she's like, it's really, it's just one little change. It's just a, it's just now you say number three aid pack. And I said, okay, you do what you have to do to get me an eight pack. And I went and I sat down with my kids. And y'all, for I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but for weeks afterward, even still now today, sometimes I go and I order my number five eight pack and I say it like this. I like the number three formerly known as the number five eight pack. <laughs> <laughs> because change is hard, yeah. especially when it's been that way for as long as you know and you raised your kids. OK, whatever. Thank you. All right. Let's give Sarah a hand clap. <laughs> One more comment on self question. Anybody else want to give a comment on self, self, self? Yes. If you'll tell us your name and where you're serving. Yeah, I'm Melissa Smith, uh, Smoky Mountain District and clergy. Monty helped us understand that uh, maybe a part of our challenges as churches is that it's been a while since we've had that burning bush experience. Mm. That maybe it's just been business as usual. We've gotten complacent, wow. and we've just done what we've always done. And uh, that's still something that I'm still trying to process as individuals, but also as churches. Wow, thank you. Let's give them a hand clap for their comments. <laughs> and so we see self-differentiation can be difficult because of change. And as we see the number five, now that's the number three. And then from the comment that we just heard, of what it means to forget or not remember or the distance from that burning bush moment. And so this is what we see from Moses' leadership as it relates to this question around self,
who am I or who are we? And this is important for what we call our missional hubs. Now, let's shift on to that next question. And this is about others. And when we think about others, it is what are we called to? So we go through this moment of self-differentiation, and then once we determine this unique call, this unique purpose, this unique vision, then we collectively bring that together and we say, okay, what is the mission field? What is the vision? Where is God calling us to? And so with this sense of self and purpose, we are able to fully live into our true calling individually and collectively. As Methodists, we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ. But what does that specifically look like on the ground level? How you make disciples in your district may be different from how people make disciples in other districts, but we are all collectively making disciples together. I love looking at churches across the country and their different missional hubs, from food pantries to quilting ministries to voter registration drives, after school programs, car repair ministries, local and global missions, adoption and foster care programs, community cleanup, home repair, church in Georgia just on the news on yesterday before we came here to the Holston Conference, they made the news because this local church understood that there was a local public school where individuals in that school could not eat lunch because they had not paid their lunch fees. This local church paid the lunch fees for the entire school. Isn't that amazing? And they're working with other churches to do that for all of the schools in the county. Now, you'll never see that in the book of discipline. You'll never see that directly in the Holy Bible. But that's through discernment, through the Holy Spirit and working together that we find a need and we do what? We address it. Now, I want to share a missional hub by a young lady at our local church. And her name is Ari. Ari is 17 years old. And she's about to graduate from high school. And I think about Moses and how he started this movement through this specific missional hub to deliver the children of Israel to the promise. And I think about Ari as this 17-year-old high school student who also started her own missional hub. Because what we're discovering about missional hubs is people aren't asking for permission anymore. They're filling the Holy Spirit and they're gathering the people and the resources and they're doing what? Going out to do the ministry and the mission that God has called them to. Now, here's a little bit about Ari. She is a youth volunteer in our Maximum Impact Program and that's our youth ministry at our church. She's done summer missions projects and she represented Impact at the recent Global Youth Conference in South Africa. Now, she's 17 at this point, but for her 16th birthday, on a Sunday, Ari told her family to forget about giving her any gifts. Instead, she wanted to use the money to pay for a potluck meal to feed Atlanta's homeless men and women. And in 2019, Ari received the Game Changer Youth Award for philanthropic and community service activities. And so what we're seeing is that not only are churches and districts developing missional hubs, but there are young people in their teens who are also filling the call of God on their life and they're developing their own missional hubs. Now, what blew us away as leaders of our local church, and if you have leaders like we have leaders, we think we know everything, we think we're on the cutting edge, and we think that everybody has to come through us to get permission from Almighty God to go do what God has called them to do. Do you know what this 16-year-old young lady did? She simply informed us via email that this is what she was up to. She didn't ask us for permission, and watch this. She didn't even ask us for money. Because when you have the call of God on your life, God will provide the resources that you need. She didn't ask for anything. She just simply wanted us to know that as a 16 year old, she was going to a local park in downtown Atlanta and she was gonna feed homeless brothers and sisters in need. Now, let's take a look and a slice at the corporate community. And before we finish Ari's story, let me bring in what's happening not only in the church, 
But what else also is happening in the business community? This wonderful book, Think Outside the Building, this is a quote, and it talks about a particular type of leadership that we're seeing that is allowing people like Ari and you to lead in a missional way. And it's called advanced leadership. <clears throat> what is advanced leadership? It involves working beyond boundaries, across silos, and outside of established structures. Sounds a little bit religious, doesn't it? This is a business book. And what they're realizing is, if they're going to do business in this new economy, in this new world, they have to have a different type of leadership, advanced leadership, that is focused across silos and outside of established structures. To live out our call individually and in community like Moses and Ari, we have to be willing to think and act outside of the box. We've got to get outside of our borders and we have to get outside of our what? Buildings. Because the spirit of God is calling us out, not what? In. And guess what? You're going to have to connect with some people who think differently, who look differently, who act differently, who behave differently differently? You mean those folks believe this about baptism? Yes. Are they Christians? Yes. How do we work together? You mean these folks believe this theologically? Yes. Are they Christians? Yes. But we got to work together. That's what it means to work outside of our structures and our silos. Even as Methodists, we don't all work together within Methodism. So how can we work together in the broader Christian community? The business world is beating the local church and what we started through the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. What does Matthew's gospel say? Does it say go into some of the world? Does it say stay in your district? Come on, somebody. Does it say stay in your annual conference? But what does it say? Go into what nations? Come on, somebody. What nations? All the nations. And so that is the mandate that we get through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's a quote from the book that I want to share. The journey to advanced leadership often begins with identifying change. Leaders must think of themselves as agents that make a difference in the world, not merely as presiding over whatever their organization makes. For so long as Methodists, because our structure has allowed us to, we've been able to preside over what Methodism makes. And through our general agencies, our annual conferences, our districts, our jurisdictional leadership, we've been able to preside over what we make. But the world has shifted. Earlier this week, I had lunch with one of my former seminary professors, and across the table, he looked at me and said, Olu, the church as we knew it will no longer be the same again. That was it. And he was right. The Methodist church as you knew it will no longer be the same again. Your local church as you knew it will no longer be the same again. Your community as you knew it will no longer be the same again. And I know some of us aren't fully able to lead into the future because we're still grieving the past. But God is saying it will never be the same again. That image that you had a vacation Bible school when you were 18 will never be the same again. The way that you were able to reach kids when you were in youth ministry at 22 will never be the same again. The way that you were able to stand up and convince people to give in an offering plate just simply because you're a church will never be the same again. The way you were supposed to put on a shingle and it was a great Cokesbury sign that said church starts at 10 o'clock and just because people were raised in a way to where they believed no matter what they did during the week that they should be in church on Sunday morning, that world is gone. But here is the opportunity for advanced new leadership thinking to be able to engage a world that is shifting to know that there are still more people to be reached with the love of Jesus Christ. We need a new generation of missionaries who aren't confined by the structures or the systems that may restrict their vision or their call. 
See, Ari's story in, empowers and inspires us because we're realizing that there are people in this world who still want to reach people for Jesus Christ. They just don't want to go through all the steps to do it that we make them go through. But if we're willing to adjust as leaders, I promise you, Luke's gospel is right. There are 72 others that you haven't even met yet who are more than willing to help you lift your missional hub. They're just not going to do it through the structure and the bureaucracy that you want to put them through or make them wait through. So this business book is right. We got to think where outside of the structure, outside of the building, outside of the organization. So here is what Ari did. So at 16 years old, she has this wonderful vision. She doesn't ask for permission. She doesn't ask for money. She develops her own missional hub as a 16 year old. She develops the box lunches. She puts those together. And as a 16 year old was, she puts some glitter and all that kind of stuff on them and she makes them bling. And then guess what she does without going through the church's permission? She goes and recruits some volunteers. And I look at this picture, I say, I know these folks. I see them every Sunday. I didn't recruit them to help Ari. Ari recruited them. And then what happens? Lives are changed. That's a missional hub. Did it cost the church anything? No. But what did it show us? If we're willing on a church level, a district level, or an annual conference level to give people permission and empower them to do what's already inside of them, we will change the world in ways you've never seen before. And you won't have to wait until annual conference. You won't have to wait until general conference. You won't have to wait until jurisdictional conference. As a matter of fact, you will go into those conferences with testimonies of the work that you and others have been able to do through Jesus Christ. Here's a quick video of Ari. That's Ari's story. A-R-I. A-R-I. Yep. A-R-I. And you can follow her on Instagram, too, uh, because she would love your support. So that's Ari's story, and that's also Moses' story. But it begins with this deep self-conversation, and it shifts from self to others. So pull out your hand out again. Look at your bottom left quadrant. Others. What are we called to? Now, here's where I want you to spend the next five minutes to talk about what are some hub opportunities. Now, we've been setting this thing up and did a great job of this creative thought and how we can use what we are creatively in the work of God. Phil's going to knock a home run. And this is where we are here in this middle passage section to what are some current hub opportunities that you need to evolve to the next level or what are some hub opportunities that you need to introduce that currently you're not doing, but will reach the community around you in a different way? So let's take five minutes and we'll be right back. All right, as we recenter in the room, are there two folks who wanna give a commentary on your journey with others and what a missional hub would look like for you? Two volunteers, two volunteers. Okay, Mike Eastridge was sharing with us that his wife works at St. Jude and the reason I wanted to volunteer and share this is that because I think this is probably applicable across our entire conference, um, is that um, the children that come to St. Jude's, there's a large majority of them that are being treated that do not have a nuclear family of parents. Not only are they not being raised by parents, they're being raised by grandparents who have retired and who are tired and who have raised their children who are moving uh, on in life but now they're found that they are uh, raising uh, their children's children because of drug abuse or jail or multiple um, reasons. So I think he shared that in Dickinson County that 70% of children, is that correct, are being raised by their grandparents. As a former elementary school teacher, if you think about that, that's seven out of 10 children that are noted that are being raised by grandparents that were raised in a different generation and have different values and different understandings. And um, 
I don't know about you, but it's hard to keep up with children, and I'm not very old. <laughs> Thank you. So that sounds like a mission feel right there. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we are called to is children and young adults. And to bring young adults into the church, you have to have activities for them, and you need a young adult to go get a young adult. Because, uh, unfortunately, most of us don't even know young adult lingo. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, we cannot capture them. We had a workshop last week on uh, domestic violence, and... um, I had one young adult, and she brought in 20 women. Wow. And so then after that was over, we um, let them know we were starting a once-a-month group, which will deal with substance abuse, because most of them have been involved in that, as well as any other topics that we put together. There will also be training for the children at that time, so they don't have to worry where the children are going. And then um, that they each will get a mentor. And so... Uh, it doesn't matter if your church has 100 young adults or one. That's who will help bring them in. Awesome. Let's give Karen and Susan hand claps of praise. <clears throat> I'm not an expert on this number, but Karen brought up a good point around reaching young adults. But I think we're in an opportunity where you have the nuns and the duns. And so these nuns are typically younger adults who see themselves spiritual but not religious. But then the dull duns are not younger adults, but uh, older adults who are also disconnected from the local church um, and are no longer there. And so we have a great opportunity to reach both of these age groups. I've always heard that typically your sweet spot of reaching people is 10 above your age and 10 below your age. And it doesn't mean you can't reach outside of that range, but uh, that also helps you to understand the types of other people that you need to build with uh, who are different from you, in particular age, if possible, and so that they can help you reach not only those who are younger, but also those who are older. So we went through the self-conversation of who am I, and we moved through the uh, other's conversation, who are we called to be, but then we're going to close our time together with this question, God, what are you blessing? And so, of course, theologically, we know that God is blessing everything. But I think there's a unique blessing and calling for your specific area, your specific church, your district and your geography. And so what do we have to do? You go back to that burning bush moment and you have to remember God's promise. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12 through 14, it says the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of God's bounty to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or to the left following other gods or serving them. So in Deuteronomy 28, we know Moses is coming to the end of his journey and he's giving these farewell messages to the children of Israel. And I think if there's one thing that Moses had to do over and over again is to remind the Israelites of God's promise and to remind the Israelites of God's plan. That's what this weekend is really about as well. It is to remind you that the work that you're doing is honorable. It's to remind you that you have one of the hardest jobs in all the world, but yet God, like Esther, has called you for such a time as this. And if you don't do it, who will do it? If you don't reach, who will reach? If you don't make a difference, who will make a difference? So my hope is that this conversation that we've been having and all of the other conversations are forms of encouragement to ignite the fire that's already in you, to make that into a greater flame, to go out and do the work that no one else will do unless you do it. And that God is blessing a unique particular area just for you and for the community that you're serving. So when we think about this, we have to remind ourselves and others about the promises of God. This is the power of missions and outreach. Now, although we are called to get outside of our buildings and our structures, and offer these missional hubs throughout the world, we also have to strategically invest and use 
our buildings and our resources for ministry and missions. So I'll close our time today telling you a little bit more of our journey as a local church. And so when we started this church 13 years ago, we had a great opportunity to start in a public school. And after a few years, we were able to locate a property. I remember the person we were working with, who was a real estate agent, almost quit because it became a daunting task. We were telling this person, we don't want a church building. We want a missional outpost. It needs to be close to public transportation. It needs to be a former school or a former warehouse or a former retail space because we want a space that has been a blight in the community and our very presence there will be an uplift to the community. So hear me when I say you should not get rid of your buildings, you should not get rid of your programs, but you've got to use those strategically for the mission field of Jesus Christ. So we finally found this property and you talk about gaining and losing people. This was one of those points in our church's journey where some people left the church because for those several years at that public school, we had people who would pray that God would bless us to have a cross on the wall because that's what they had when they grew up in church. And your church can't be a church without a cross on the wall. We had people who grew up in Sunday school who prayed that when we finally got our building, we would have Sunday school rooms because they were holding us hostage to their image of Sunday school. We had other people who prayed that we would have a prayer chapel because they grew up and they were holding us hostage to a church having to have a prayer chapel. People who loved all the amenities of church, but yet forgot about the mission of church. So we found a property and this is what that property looked like on the outside. And so there were some people who came to that property and said, hey, Olu, we've been hanging with you for several years, but we really thought that when we got our own property, it would look like the church that I grew up in. You know, I'm no longer going to come here because this isn't church to me anymore. And so we had to say goodbye to some people when we bought our missional hub. And then as a people pleaser, I said, well, just go inside. It'll look better on the inside. And maybe you'll want to stay. Maybe you'll want to hang out with us a little bit longer. And so we took the people to the inside. And this is what it looked like on the inside. It was even worse. And so even more people got off the bus and said, why did you have to take us inside? We could have just stayed on the outside. But we even lost more people when we went to the inside. But you know what? Luke 72 is right. There is a remnant. There are 72 others who still believe in the power of the vision. And so with those people, what did we begin to do? We started doing prayer walks through that building. And we started to believe God that this would be more than a church. This would be a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week center that reached people for Jesus Christ. And like here in the Holston Annual Conference, would deploy people through training, through enrichment, through prayer, into the mission field. And so we believe God for different age groups, but in particular, we believe God for young people and children. Now, it's hard to believe God for young people and children when you're walking in a building where people are living in there, you're walking in a building where there is no HVAC, you're walking into a building that is a blight. But I'm telling you, when you come together with the power of the Holy Spirit and you take God's word for its word, then you will see God do some amazing things. So amazing that a man who was an octogenarian believed in the mission so much that he was able to help clean up the parking lot for the future of that church. And so it's not only about younger adults, but it's also about older adults who still believe in the power of Almighty God. And we call him Uncle Howard, and he was in his 80s when this picture was taken, but he believed in God so much that he was able to sweep out that parking lot so that people can come to what used to be a warehouse that now was a new faith community called Impact Church. We believed in kids. I remember when it was time for us to build out our children's space, like each of your churches, we didn't have enough money. And the person who helped us create this space gave us an invoice and we sent that invoice back and said, we can't do this. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll come in and trace on the walls. And if you can get a bunch of volunteers, they can simply paint by the numbers. And so these volunteers came in and they painted by the numbers and they became their own missional hub. Not about them, but about the kids who would come in. And so with that volunteer help and what used to be a blank space, 
it eventually became this for youth and children. And so now, in what used to be a blight to the community, a vacant warehouse where people were sleeping in there, doing all kinds of things in there, this is what it looks like on Sunday morning with the children of God. And so I'm not telling you to get rid of your buildings. I'm just telling you to use your buildings differently and to think beyond Sunday morning. So what happened to us is that we had to make a decision as a local church because we started looking at data. And like most local churches, we believed in building a little bit more space. And we were focusing on building more space to put more behinds in seats because every church wants to have a little bit more space to put some behinds in seats for about an hour and a half, one day a week. And we believe if we can have as many of these for an hour and a half, one day a week, then that makes us important in the kingdom of God. But God says, no, that's not the missional hub we want this church to be. And so we went to our local United Way and they published what is called the Child Wellbeing Survey for Metropolitan Atlanta. So when you go through Atlanta, this is what you normally don't know or don't see. Atlanta is a great city. I've spent 20 years of my life. Some of the largest companies in the world are based in Atlanta. We have wonderful major league teams in Atlanta. We have wonderful people in Atlanta. But when it relates to the well-being of children, Atlanta downtown and the immediate area of Atlanta is not the healthiest place for youth and children. So the greener the area is, the better it is for children. The red means it's worse. Now you can duplicate this across any major city in the United States of America. Green area is going to be suburbs. Red area is going to be inner city. So the life expectancy of a kid in the suburbs is higher than the life expectancy of a kid in the inner city of Atlanta. Yes, sir. So this is United Way of Metropolitan Atlanta, and it is a child well-being survey. It may not be unique only to United Way of Metro Atlanta. I would check with a local United Way, and they may also have it. And the great thing about this survey is you just simply type in your zip code and it will give you the score for your community. Now, here's what's unique as well. So as we look at the inner city of Atlanta, and I am a sports fan like anyone else, but we had three things to happen in Atlanta over the course of time. We uh, built a more than billion dollar a uh, football stadium called the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and that is the new home of the Atlanta Falcons, or yeah, the Falcons. Uh, a lot of people didn't know, but uh, what used to be the home of the Hawks was renamed State Form Arena. So while the new stadium for Mercedes was happening, they were also renovating the stadium for the Atlanta Hawks. You just didn't know it, it was more internal. So two new stadiums, uh, downtown Atlanta. Where the Braves played is now Georgia State University built an almost billion dollar stadium in the Cobb area. I traveled the country a good bit and I haven't seen anywhere in the country where a city has renovated or built new major league stadiums for all of their major sports at the same time. So Atlanta is unique to that. Have no issue with that. It is a tremendous blessing. Here is the challenge for me. Across the street from that billion dollar football stadium where we play less than 16 home games, and if you watched this this past year, we didn't have a great season, it's a red zone for youth and children. Across from a billion dollar stadium. And the Hawks Stadium is in walking distance. It says that if you're a kid growing up in that community, the likelihood of success is unlikely. And social scientists will tell you that the gap never gets closer, that you are literally born into a cycle of poverty that you will be into typically for the rest of your life in our community so that the red can change to a lighter color within the era of our leadership. And so that's our missional hub. And that's how we're utilizing our partners in the community 
and that's how we're also utilizing our building. So these are the three powerful conversations and questions. It's self, who am I, who are we? It's others, what are we called to be in this present generation? And it's God, what are you blessing in our context? And so when we ask God that, God says, look, if I hear y'all praying one more time about what you need to do in your local church, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> God says, here's what I'm blessing. The question is, what do you want to do about it? So I want to take this opportunity to close and get ready to transition into uh, Joshua coming and sharing. And um, these two book resources are here. And I'll have these in the back area, Leadership Directions from Moses and uh, 4D Impact. But uh, it has been a joy and a tremendous blessing to share with you. Joshua, you want to come on up? I'm not sure if you want to use this podium or, or use another area, but uh, let's celebrate Joshua as he comes up. And he is an, an awesome leader. I'll be here at the book table here in your back right. But I'm also not leaving, so I'm also here for the rest of the conference. So if you've got any individual questions or collective questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, work through those and answer as much as I can. And I want to close my time with you with a word of prayer because um, wherever you are, and sometimes people will say, well, you know, if, if I was in Atlanta, uh, my church would look like this. Or if I were in this part of the world, we would be doing this. But what I've learned is ministry is hard wherever you are and that there is unique situations for each and every one of us. When I go back to Atlanta, uh, we have leaders and we have challenges and we have a journey to take just like you. But I hope you know that we are on this mission field together and that we are called to reach people for Jesus Christ. How we do it, it may look different. But we have to do it. So I want to pray a word of hope over you and your ministries and your leadership. And, and then Joshua is going to take us forward.